Good morning, good morning, Sir Martin. What's up? October 2nd, 2023. Episode 94. We're getting closer and closer to Christmas. That time of year when everybody really um, comes together as family and show that we love each other. Not bathe each other with gifts, but bathe each other with love. It is that time of year that's coming up. Naturally, we will first have on October 9th, that is next week, we will have Constitution Day. But naturally, let me start off today on a more quieter note than normal. Let me extend my sincerest condolences to the Flanders family with the passing of a member of theirs. We have to keep a good eye on this Philippe. Philippe up and down. Philippe don't know where it want to go or where it don't want to go. And that's what makes such a storm a dangerous storm. I think it's one of the most difficult storms that the Met Office and NOAA, so the National Hurricane Center, has had to read. It has been influenced by so many different factors. One of the things we gotta remember, while it's not packing heavy winds, it's about 50, maybe it, it might get a little stronger, I believe. Um, it is packing some water. And that's my concern, because up until this day, the trenches are not ready to handle the water. While the staff of Romi is doing its utmost to ensure that water management is done right, because remember, we have no pumps working in the, fresh, in the salt pond. And naturally, the minister last time went out and said, oh, look, Bon Camper talking about it, but Bon Camper was there for decades, but the idiot has been there for the past four years and has not fixed them, because when I was there, they were running. They broke down, yes, but they were running. We kept them running but they are not doing anything. So they have no pumps. They have no movement of salt water into the Rolandes Canal other than a little six inch pipe they got there running now. Instead of the two times 36 and one times 24 inches. So we had a total of approximately seven feet of piping to trout water. Today we have six inches. That's it people. That's the reality. One fourteenth capacity we have right now. But you blame people that, were, that left the ministry four years ago. You see, that's when you're incompetent. And that's why Philippe has me so nervous. Because the movement of water, if this storm passes us now to the south, it would mean that the wave action in Great Bay is going to be significant. So you might be getting water in instead of being able to trout water. That's one. Two. The pond will fill up with a lot of rainwater because we can play with one to four inches. And now one to four inches on a flat surface means nothing. But you must look at a cul-de-sac basin. You must look at the sucker garden basin. All of these basins feed to two places, the salt pond and the fresh pond. That's why I am scared with Philippe. Other than that, Philippe would have been just a wet Sunday for us. But because of the conditions we find ourselves in, it is not, it can be a dangerous situation for us. Another something that I, I, I need to, to say something about. Yesterday, Prince Bernard Bridge was worked on and they closed the road because they had to fix the bridge. And I really was happy because the boys from Public Works, they did a great job welding back up the bridge, painting it back up and everything. But at the end of the bridge on the long wall side, the bridge ain't painted nor fixed. So all of the rest of the bridge that Public Works fixed first in the beginning, then painted up, sanded down, primed, paint again. All of that was done. But the end of the bridge is not fixed. And, and my question is simple. Why not? Is that for a contractor to do? Is that a, something for elections? I, I don't Because it is this same group of ministers that made a bunch of noise about how the former minister had done something with contractors and this and that and all kind of noise and went to the, um, had a whole investigation started on Emmanuel, you know, and, and, and now you're doing this? You see, I know it's election season and I have no problem with that because today we're going to talk about election season and today we're going to talk about how you all functioning 
And they say a lot of people will be afraid to call you out. But I, I'm not one of those. I will call you out for what you're doing. I am not going to criticize you for who you are. But I'm going to criticize you for the nonsense you're doing as a government. Because the person means nothing to me. Their families mean nothing to me. And I will not go there. I haven't, I haven't been brought up so. But I will go at you when I know what you're doing is wrong. And what you're telling the public, if Sir Martin, is a lie. Then, yes, I will deal with it. And like that, we're going to now go in to the first lie of last week. The minister of ECYS stated he had an agreement and an SLA was signed with the St. Martin School Bus Association. And that was a blatant lie. At 4 o'clock Friday afternoon, the government's lawyer sent a rush, rush invitation to the lawyer of the School Bus Association to please, let's come together, let's work this out. Minister, do you have a big favor? Stop this lying stupidity. It ain't the first time you're doing this. But it is your character that's the problem. Your arrogance, your ignorance that is causing this thing to become such a big problem. Yes, I agree in a regulation. I agree with policies. I even agree that you agree what you're going to pay. But it is an agreement. It's not an instruction. It ain't a take it or leave it or I'm going to tender it. Where you're going to fix the tender like how the one from Vromius will fix. That's what you're trying to tell us. The difference is there are not many school buses driving around that are not being used. Or you have a company that's going to import them from Florida. Because the way you all are behaving is crazy. You see, now these are the type of things that I am concerned about. Minister comes out and speaks about bullying in schools. But you are bullying, you are bullying the school bus drivers. Because you are telling them it's a take it or leave it. That's what a bully does. You either give me the money or beat you up. You're doing the same thing. But now you are trying to do it under the heading of government. You're trying to show the people of Samaritan what type of government you all are. And I'm happy for that piece. But we got to change. In the world of today, we can't do this. But you see, I'm happy with the lawyer the school bus drivers got. Can I go, gentleman? He's 75 years old. He has seen it all. So he really don't care and he gonna tear you asunder, brother. Maybe that's something you gotta reconsider. You wanna put yourself on a party list? You should reconsider getting thrown asunder for something that you can't change anyway. It's been about 560 days now, if I add on the few days since the article came out, that GB has remained a mystery regarding the inaccurate billing after the ransomware attack. This was a position that MP Lutmila de Weaver took um, last week in Parliament. Now, I support that position for the mere fact that up until today, there has been no real answer from the shareholder. So I am not interested in what GB's management has to say. GB management doesn't report to the public of St. Martin. It reports to the shareholders. So does the board of directors. They report to the shareholders. When we call on GB, we call on the shareholders to come to Parliament and explain Parliament what's happening. Nobody up until today can come with a formal report and say, this is what happened. These are the consequences of the hack. This is what we're going to do. This is the position we are in financially. This is what we can't collect until this day. This is what's outstanding. Nothing. Zero. This is your government. Today, my show is going to be called Blowsy Monday. Because blows going to fall today. But factual blows going to fall. Not personal blows. Factual blows. Because if what I'm saying is a lie, come out, call your conferences on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 
so you can come and say what I'm saying is wrong. Because what I'm saying is the truth. Nobody is speaking out. This hands-off approach seems to be on convenience. Only on convenience. I need to also send out a congratulations. Because that's what I believe it is. I, you know, because of in between some of this negativity, there are some positive moments. Claude Javois, he came with a project about five years ago. It was the Green Initiative. Today we call it the Green Dream. And it's happening in schools where waste programs or waste management programs, a project like that, with separation, recycling, takes place. And it started off in one school, the academy, where he was teaching. And it has multiplied. Now I know we have the Catholic school board is involved. We have the Mac. This is one man who has a master's in science with waste. Applied by Vromi for a job, never even had the decency to get an answer. Works at the schools and does this. You see, we have talent. We just don't respect it. And then they said they got a job for coming again. Last time they had a mixer, 300 plus people went there, one was hired. You see, I said these things not to be sarcastic, but to show you that when they say they're doing things, they're not doing anything. They're just fronting with a mirage, a show, a smoke screen, a make-believe. Because if Claude, Mr. Claude Javois can do this in the schools, why haven't they called him? I mean, the Minister of Education must know this program going on. He could have whispered in his friend, the Minister of Rome, hey, listen, why don't we check that? Maybe, you know, you can make a little something, expand this, do a little recycling, because there is a hauler involved. The hauler is taking the stuff from the schools and looks for a market outside. Recycling is something that I told you all from since I left Rome, that the MRF should have come. That's a material recovery facility where recycling can take place, where at least 50 to 100 people could get a job with sorting garbage. Pull out the plastics, pull out the, the metal, the wood, the cardboard. These are recyclable things. If we really were going to do something, instead of following this waste management solution BS that is going on now since 2018, we are five years further. And all we have done in the landfill is continue throwing garbage and continue throwing sand. Put a bulldozer there, put a little cement um, compactor there, and that's it. Listen, we ain't doing nothing. Go talk to Claude. Claude might be able to give us some sort of help. So at least he can open up our mind that without anything, you can do something. Instead of taking tens of millions of dollars and pissing it down the drain. Because that's what we're doing right now. Now... Something else that caught my eye was the summer hotel rooms occupancy is down 9% compared to last year, says the SHTA. But the islands around us seems to be having a much better experience, a much better occupancy rate. And maybe it's time that we start looking at what the real issues are. Um, and I listed a few of them, and I'm sure there are much more. But I just did this to start up the conversation. Is it the bad shape of the arrivals at the airport? Is this playing? Is this having an effect because people are talking about it on the social media and people are saying, well, I don't want to really stand up an hour and a half, two hours in the sun going to St. Martin. I would prefer to go to maybe St. Kitts or Antigua or Totola. I don't know. Is it the large amount of uncontrolled Airbnbs we are having on in our country where people are staying there so they are not filling the hotel rooms and that might have been a reason that we dropped in occupancy rate now mind you when we just did this and i spoke about this um last week yet when we did the census we realized that in certain areas on the island more the high-end areas on the island a lot of rooms from houses were filled with guests so the census didn't really worry with them because they were guests on the island. But guess what? Those guests are Airbnb guests because they're not staying in a hotel. So again, how does this pan out? Um, has any um, comparisons been done with that? Did our arrivals drop in numbers 
to 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 see this would would for example a preclearance solve the airlift because this SHT was speaking about the very expensive airlift now a way to bring down airlift is to have more airlines fly to your country at a lower rate also it becomes competitive when you get low-cost carriers flying into your country like a southwest for example um, or spirit it means that your coverage goes down now the reason most of these uh, local cost carriers don't want to come here is because of the turnover time when they reach back to the states they have to land at an international gate and it will mean customs immigration it takes them about three hours to clear the aircraft while if you have pre-clearance it takes about 45 minutes to clear an aircraft turn it around and put it back up in the air that's a huge savings in the airline business so they can drop their rates coming to your country and still make money this is one of the major benefits of pre-clearance something to think about because um the now party stands very strongly for pre-clearance it's one of the pillars that we really want to work on to ensure that we can bring airlift and um tourists to the island so maybe it's something that i said let me see if this might be something what about is there a clear indication in the destination drop from the countries they come from the biggest group of people we have is normally the american market so was the nine percent um drop from the american market or did it also have to do with the south american market the caribbean market the european market wherever we are is there any indication because again you know we talk about taxes and all these type of things and i agree if we are going to implement taxes and i'm going to um elucidate about that later if we're going to implement taxes, I think it's very important that we also stick a, a tag to it. If we're going to implement certain taxes at the airport, maybe those taxes should go directly into the coffers of marketing countries in Martin. Again, the, the, these are things that we have to talk about and, and, and look at more carefully. And as the No Party releases its manifesto piece by piece, you're going to see these things in its manifesto. The Carbon Group, now, th this this is normally something I wouldn't even go at because I think um, justice will take its toll there just now. But it is affecting a lot of investors every day. There's something in the newspapers about this whole carbon acquisition group and the carbon grove, etc. But we're talking about 150 uh, couples that seemingly might have been swindled in this whole case. Now, I even saw that the, the whole team used to be family members, and then it was church members. And again, it, it, it's not about that. What it's about is what's happening. And if you like it or not, this is giving Samaritan a bad name. This is not the first time this is happening. We had it in Red Pond. We had it in that building going down there past Casablanca where <clears throat> there were court verdicts that the monies paid at the closing by the notary in a pre-development stage should not be given to the developer. Now, I am getting those verdicts. I have asked for them. I'm going to go through them this week, and I'll come back and discuss it. Because if in pre-development money should not be given to the developer, then how did it happen by the carbon group? Because the money went there. It should have stayed in escrow seemingly by the notary. Now I'm not 100% sure yet on all these facts. So that's what I'm saying, I'm coming back at it, but I'm gonna look at it. But there are so many things. I mean, people are sending me messages. They're sending me um, extracts on certain things. It, it, it's getting scary because how many deeds were signed by the notary? Because that's one of the things now that we we are not sure of. I am understanding it might have been one original deed, and then that deed was just copy and pasted. And new names went in, new unit numbers went in. If this is the case, then that is an outright case of fraud. I pray to God it's not. But that's the elucidation or the direction that... People are showing me, you gotta walk that road, you're going to find it. I am not the investigator. That's for the Justice Department to do. I know they listen to my show. 
every Monday. So hopefully they can also pick the sense out of what I'm saying. And if it's nonsense, just move on. But I want to not just stop by the carbon group. I want to look backwards a minute to these real estate groups. These real estate people that come and sell real estate in Samantha. They just reach here. They go to the notary, they get a license, and they start to sell real estate. No way of holding them liable because you saw what happened with the group. As the shit hit a fan, they jump on a plane, they were gone. They sell what they had, they were gone. Nobody know where to be. Where in the world is Carmen San Diego? You remember that movie? That little TV series? This is what happens with these groups. They come here, they settle up, or you get groups from the French side selling on the Dutch side. This is something the economics department with licensing has to seriously take a look at. Instead of just giving away bus licenses because elections come in, minister, go do some homework. This is something where you got to really go and make a difference now. Because this is affecting the economy of this country. Look, we have real estate companies here that have been established for years. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about these Johnny come lately, these fly by nights, go pay $1,500, get less $3,000, get a license and move on. This is something we need to start looking at much, much better because we are being screwed as country by these people that come here, do what they got to do, make their money and move. And nobody's held accountable. They don't even pay taxes. Those people don't even pay taxes. Tax office never heard of these companies, yet they have a license. I think we need to look at this, and then this will give us an idea of what's really happening. But the way I see what's happening here right now, I don't think this is going to really end good for the group, the carbon group. I think with one of the banks now contemplating on auctioning off, the Carbon Grove Group, uh, the, the buildings in Cold Bay, and then you had people writing, oh, don't go and press no charges. Within a month or two, everything will be fixed. If that was true, the bank wouldn't be doing what they're doing. That's the problem. So somebody lying to somebody, and we got to understand who it is lying. And right now, I put in my hand on the developer. I ain't think the banks are lying. I don't think all the other people are lying. I think the developer is lying. And that's very unfortunate because it's hurting a lot of people. Even the people that are working there, I saw an article in the newspaper, they get them bits and pieces of their salaries. If things were going to be fixed within a month, as was said by the developer's family, I think it was the wife that spoke, Ooh, why didn't you pay employees? If you had gotten a cash injection, because that's what you need, for millions, then why didn't pay employees? Your most trustworthy servants that through thick and thin have been taking blows for you. You see, that's the problem we have in this country. So, in Holland, the second chamber got a little irritated now with the prosecutor's office. Why? Because they feel that 25 million euros they're given extra every year must lead to the necessary investigations. Not only the politicians, but in Stacia, the commissioner wrote to the Minister of Justice and stated there was voters tampering, voters fraud in the elections in March of this year because four out of the 10 votes were done by proxy. That was her opinion. There was a whole to do with the prosecutor's office. Tell them, don't worry, don't, don't press those charges. We are not going to look into it anyway. And an article came out to that effect. Then you had the whole INYA, where the prosecutor's office in Curacao said, oh, we don't have capacity, oh, we don't have this, oh, we don't have that. Well, now the second chamber wants to know what the hell is really wrong with the prosecutor's office. Why are you behaving so? And rightfully so. Because some of these people believe that they're coming down here for vacation. They're only coming down here to grab hold of politicians and all kind of craziness. Because if you look at all their cases, 
That's basically what they are. That's basically what they are. In a Ruba Cruz House of Martin, they go in after the big boys, politicians. But that's I really can't touch. Here in Samantha, when they grab big boys, they cut a deal with them right away, leave them pay and move on. Only politicians they ask for. That you know, I was happy when they had the new, and you know, people say, Lord, bugs don't do this. They had this new attorney general coming out. And you know what he did? He spoke in Papiamento, he's a Kyrselinian, Mr. Scope. Thank you. Thank you. He showed the judges and the prosecutors that in courts, they're going to use papiamento also because the people that are in courts need to understand from the prosecutor's office directly in the language they speak what their charges are and what they're up against. Because nine out of the ten now seemingly don't even go to courts because they don't understand what's happening. So they just prefer to settle and take whatever punishment they get because it can only get worse for them. That's not a justice system, you know. That's a banana republic system that people are afraid of the courts. Not because of the righteousness, but of the injustice because they can't understand what's happening. This is what the new attorney general message was. Last week in Curacao. And I salute him. I salute him. So here in St. Martin, the No Party is also asking for an Attorney General, a Prosecutor General, that will speak English. And that when we get judges that come down here, they should at least understand the language. Now, Papiamento, in Curacao, there are a lot of judges that have learned Papiamento. So that helps a lot. But this is the first time really where a attorney general took this stance. While we have had previous attorney generals that were locals. Big Pierre was one, he was a local, but he spoke Dutch. Mr. Scope decided he would speak Papiamento and I salute him. So now with this whole second chamber thing, Let's see what we're going to roll out of it. Let's see what the story is going to be from the prosecutor's office. Why they didn't do certain things. Let's just see. Again, another thing that caught my eye was the St. Martin Insurance Brokers Association. They took a stance. And I'm extremely happy. They took a stance. Because the public of St. Martin, or the public in general, we get hit by two groups. The banks and the insurance companies. We are always the weakest party in those contracts. And the St. Martin insurance brokers have asked the central bank as the overseer of these two groups to ensure, to ensure that the weaker party in the contracts, the clients, the people of the country, get a better deal. Get a better protection. The laws in Curacao and Samantha are identical, yet they are implemented differently. And you very often hear MP Bryson and MP Emanuel talk about that, that we don't get our fair share from the central bank. The now party believes in seceding from the bank and go our own way and get a monitoring system for the next 10 years, maybe under the Dutch central bank and use people that we have sons of the soil, like a Eugene Holiday, to run something like this. We have our people that can do this. Maybe this is a direction we need to start going. We don't need a Caribbean Gilda. We don't need it. Some people want it, because why would the central bank cut off their own neck to tell Sir Martin it's the right thing? Dollarize and go... Um, under a monitoring system. Why would they do that? <laughs> the president of the bank will lose his one million guild a year salary. Why would he do that? All of them will come up with all kinds of reports and everything. If it's working for Cruz, oh, for Bonaire, Sabre Station under the Dutch Central Bank, why can't it work for us? Why? Nobody seems to be going on that way. We got a friend side with Euros. 
No, that doesn't affect us. It only helps us. Cut the euro stronger than the dollar so we get more economic turn. You see, people, we need to look at things differently. We need to honestly start looking at things differently. But last week was also International Maritime Day. And it was our Minister of Tiat, and I addressed it as utterly nonsense in one of my previous shows. Said how we could make up a what? 470,000 guilders and ship registration yet this year. Look, there was the International Maritime Day, and I know nobody from Samaritan was there. We have two ex um, inspectors, and none of them were in Curacao, and that's unfortunate. We have no real offices here. We can't do ship registration. But maybe you should have sent them Curacao. Start discussing with Curacao or the Netherlands how you're going to set this up so that maybe in a few years we can reach that goalpost of ship registration because it brings a lot of, um, it needs a lot of expertise and it brings a lot on your plate. You need to have a flag, your own flag, because right now they have to sail on the, the Dutch flag because in the past it was the Antillian flag. Now it's the Dutch flag. And secondly, your whole judicial system has to be set up to handle these type of um, events also because since they're flying under your flag, they're going to be tried in your courts. But these are things, Minister, when you do your homework, you'll understand what you're up against instead of just screaming, we're going to do this and this and that, and screaming, Delta coming, you know, listen, your term is nearly over, thank God for that. So, when will we know what's really happening come October 10th with the loans, the liquidity loans? When are we going to know it? And this is where I really got to look a minute and ask myself, who fooling who? Who's really lying to whom? Saturday was September 30th. Deadline for Curacao and St. Martin to accept the agreement of Enya. That was a hard deadline. That wasn't moving, said the State Secretary von Hoflan on behalf of the Dutch government. So, September 30th came and gone, not nothing. So what now? What happens now? Does that mean for the layman that we gonna have to pay six to eight percent additional on the loan? Does that mean that the minister will not go ahead anymore with the India deal? What, what does it mean? Because the silence is deafening. But I'll tell you what I believe is going to happen. I believe the Minister of Finance will sign the loan. That is a Dutch puppet. He will sign the loan. The Parliament of Samantha has made it extremely clear already when they ransacked him in there in a central committee meeting about the Enya loans, that they don't support the Enya loan. And something much better can be done. But again, you see, Sir Martin's government and coalition partners in parliament, when the coho was the big problem, it became good cop, bad cop. You remember? Silveria said, we're going this way. Bryson said, we're going the other way. And Knopf said, I don't care what none of you are doing, but Parliament is going to put in writing that they're supporting the Coho law. Otherwise, no money. And Parliament did so. There was a letter written to that extent. You know, you play with languages. Time has taught us that that was illegal, what Knopf did. The state, the Council of State in the Netherlands threw out that whole position of Knopf's threw it out, said that the coho law was illegal, etc., etc. So lessons were learned. Lessons were learned. But again, now they come in with the Enya run. And Holland will do just like what they did in the past. If push come to shop, they will come with a mutual agreement between countries. I will give you this, and you agree to this. It's between the two governments, and there's no need, listen carefully, there's no need for Parliament's um, approval. Where does the problem stand for the government of Samaritan? 
with the amended budget 2023. Because that budget needs to be approved by Parliament. You see, if there was no budget 2023, I think the coalition partners were sitting on hot potatoes because the budget was already approved and budget 2024, push come to shove, if they shoot it down, the next government will have to take it on. But the obligation by country St. Martin has already been inked. So, yes, we can say we can hold the Minister of Finance accountable, but it doesn't work so easy. Because this was an agreement vetted by the Dutch government. Because they too put in the signature on it. So it would have been a long, drawn-out court case, most probably, who right and who wrong and who this and who that. But at the end of the day, your budgets can't pass, you can't do much. So I think there's going to be a whole playground show in Parliament yet to come. I foresee this. And it is to see who will stand where and who will throw which shot. And then we will know how much strength this government still has, but more importantly, who's standing where. Elections are coming, people. You all saw what happened to the Minister of Justice last week. Elections are coming. Now, again, there's a second deadline that still has a game to play. That is October 15th. Why does it still have a game to play? Because October 15th, and now suddenly, if you read the Dutch media, if you read um, some of the medias in Curaçao, the Dutch have said, oh, no, 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 listen, listen, the deal is not off the table yet, you know. The deal ain't off the table. So the, dead ha the hard deadline of September 30th from Van Hoflund actually meant nothing. It was just hot air. Let me put it that way. Because at this point in time, the Dutch government is saying A, B, C, D. So there still seems to be hope someplace in this whole matter. What it's going to be, I don't know yet. Uh, the next few days is going to show that a little better. But then we will see where we really, 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 really stand with this. Okay, school children and the road safety. The Winter Islands Teachers Union, um, their leader, Mr. Johnson, wrote to the government and said, listen, for years we have been struggling with the school safety, especially by the Orania School, but let me add in my own few also, but also up in South Reward and there by St. Peter's with the crossings, the pedestrian crossing, the speed bumps, etc. There's a lot of reckless driving goes on. Teachers have to fight their way from front street with the children or back street, cross back street, down through the alley to get to the school buses for Orania School because there's not a place to pack. When you go to Milton Peters College or you go to Magda School or you go into St. Peter's, you can see the traffic. You see the thousands of children on the roadside. It takes one car to lose control and you have a, a, a disaster on your hand. And the speed that certain people are driving with. And then you have these youngsters doing wheelies up and down and the chance of an accident is, is significant. And I am not saying I have the solutions, but I think it's something we should look at and look at very cautiously because the last thing you need is that we have a major problem on our hands with this. We need a structural change though in how the traffic is regulated up there during the starting and the ending of the school because that's when it's really, um, maybe we need specifically um, have people um, to handle these matters. I know the control units used to do it for a while. Um, maybe the traffic police can get a unit put together that can handle these type of things on a daily basis and other traffic situations on a daily basis um, to f um, temporarily find a solution that way. I'm not sure yet, so I don't want to sit down here and give you a solution. I'm not 100% sure of it yet. The ANIA proposal. And here, yes, um, I'm going to take a step back. ANIA as party, the party I come from now, the no party, I sat with MP Emanuel and we discussed this. And I asked Emmanuel, please, when you go to Parliament in this meeting, make this proposal. I believe it's a good proposal. And I saw MP Bryson also gave a great elucidation on another way to do it. Um, kudos to Mr. Bryson. I think he did his homework, to be very honest with you. 
he went down into the budget of the Dutch to show that they have $362 billion in guaranteed debts all over the world, from the Ukraine, throughout Africa, throughout Caribbean countries. But $600 million is too much to save your own kingdom people, your own Dutch people. It's too much. But $362 billion is okay. You see, when they talk about equality, you all say, ah, man, you're yeah, getting on so far. This is clearly, we are not equal. Because if you can't take care of your own, who you expect to take care of them? The Americans? The Chinese? The Canadians? The Arabs? Whom? You see, Bryson went a step further. He said, listen, to start with, they don't need 600 million come January 1st. They need it over years. The Dutch wanted one shot, not spread over five years or 10 years. They want that 600 million put in there and you lock down for another generation as country to pay back loans. That's what the Dutch want. And then Van Hoflen reached here Saturday. September 30th, deadline of the loans. To talk about the slavery past? You serious, man? Oh, you people, you, you have no considerations. That is clear. She came to St. Martin to talk about the slavery past. When you are jamming us into another loan for 30 years to tie down another generation. This is the new style recolonization. That's what we call it. New style recolonization. Tie them down with loans that they will always owe us, always be in our debt, and we will always control those countries. You see, and when William Marlin jumps up and bashes the Dutch about the hatching a plan for to thief mullet there from us, people get upset. Oh, when you bashing the Dutch, you must bash the Dutch. This one are going all out with him. This one, William has my support. Because it is strange that the elucidation of MP Bryson, which broke it down in small change, hasn't gotten no airtime in Holland no attention from our Minister of Finance, who in my eyes now is looking more and more like the Dutch puppet in that government. But I will make it clear to all. Today, suddenly there's a newspaper article that the Mullet Bay properties that was evaluated, I think for $90 million dollars, don't hold me to that, but I think it's about 90 million. By a renowned, listen carefully, huh? by a world renowned um, group of people that do land evaluations. And now, suddenly, it is evaluated by Ansari, who again started something, to about $200 million to about $300 million between 260 and 480. So between two and $300 million, Mullet Bay is now evaluated for. And that's because the towers, the 14 towers were built next door, giving Mullet Bay uh, property uh, a serious boost in, um, in price. So nearly two, three times the price went up. I hope that if that philosophy is true, that with the Bethlehem build, um, development coming in Dutch Quarter, that the lands in Dutch Quarter will also triple in value and the people will be sitting on a great piece of asset moving forward. I think it's nonsense with this land evaluation of Ansari. I think it's just a way to wiggle himself out of paying the one point something billion that he has to really pay. But to get back to the proposal, because what did the now party say? We said we need to ensure that government, government of Samantha, can get back Mullet Bay. 
once and for all. It's private property, but let's see if we can get it back in a transaction. Now that transaction was going to be very simple, oh, simple. It has naturally the necessary calculative works to be done, but we would see what it would cost to take all the employees, all the insured pensioners from India that reside in Samatin um, and bring them to APS. We will then have to pay those premiums um, for those people and those premiums would then mean um, that we tie into what India used to offer versus what APS is going to offer. We have to make sure that there's a transition that everybody becomes APS in short. Depending on the cost, we wanted that Enya then relinquishes the land that they now have back in their control called Mullet Bay. That will be relinquished debt-free to St. Martin because the value of those insured will be offset because St. Martin is taking that debt now to ensure those um, premiums and pensions will not be lost and cut by 80% that we will then get the Mullet Bay property and if Enya owes us more or we owe Enya yet for the land, then that difference will be set in a contract. And that way, St. Martin will pay Enya or Enya will pay St. Martin over a 10 year span, but we will take care of the pension policy holders, the pensionados, they will go through APS. That's in a nutshell, how we would want to do this. Now, again, it doesn't mean to say that this is a very simple process, but it is a doable process. It is a process where everybody wins. St. Martin, as country wins, the pensioners that were by Enya that might suffer the loss of 80% of their pensions and or investments, they will be safeguarded and at the end of the day, hopefully, between APS and Country St. Martin, we can start a development at Mullet Bay. And maybe we too can build, let's call them 15s. We will build a few 15 towers. And those two will yield significant income for Country St. Martin slash APS. Everything can happen if there's a will for it to happen. Now, St. Martin government doesn't have to go into the hotel business or the condo business. That's not what they should be doing in their core business. But let us not pretend that in Curacao the governments aren't involved in the hotels, or in Aruba they aren't involved in the hotels, or in Holland they aren't involved in the hotels, because only we, with our hands, are BS keep pretending stupidity, especially this government, especially, you know, I believe in hands off, but we are not hands off. We throw them out and they could do what they want. There's no hands on either. There's nothing right now. And corporate governance, when they give an advice, nobody listens anyway, because they're friends or family that they're going to appoint. So please get off of this stupid hoss you're on right now and at least do something for country. All this, we are one nonsense. What about country above self? That was the oath we took. All of us took it, including me. But some of us forget we took it. Again, I strongly believe the proposal the now party brought in through independent member MP Emmanuel is a good proposal. I believe that proposal will lead to the country getting back one of its most valuable pieces of land that everybody uses, we can then build a road at the front side of the beach and ensure that the beach belongs to everybody to use. Put down at least 500 parkings there on the front piece so everybody could go to the beach without having to park all over on the roads outside. Create a nice additional offset parking lot. Everybody can use it. Look, it ain't a rocket scientist. We need to do 
what we need to do for the people of Samaritan. But we must have that will. If we don't have that will, it ain't gonna happen. But you know, what caught me in the meeting was the behavior of the finance minister. Because the finance minister believes that the Enya loan agreement with the Dutch is a fabulous idea. It's wonderful. And that's the way to go. And that's what I said already before. He going to sign the loan. So help my God, he going to sign it. And he going to put all of us in bondage. Don't ask me why. But when you're the favor, you know, when you're the favorite one by the Dutch, you have to start looking a little harder why. But that's for another time. When I hear him speak, when I hear William speak, when I hear Rolando speak, there are two things that come up in my mind. Who do I believe? The minister or the two faction leaders of the coalition government? Who do I believe? Is it the Council of Ministers, through its mouthpiece, the Minister of Finance? Or do I believe the up party faction leader, the leader of the up party, Rolando Bryson, or the faction leader of the National Alliance, the veteran William Allen? Who do I believe? That's one. The second thing is, who has the right helicopter view? Or does no one have this one? Because it was a matter of fact that the Prime Minister said you must have a helicopter view if you really want to see everything what's happening around you to run a company, more or less run a country. But listen, listen. I know the Minister of Finance, he in charge of Coursera. So maybe he can get his boys them a few courses, everybody sign up for a few courses, and I figure out the strategic thinking, helicopter view thing, and then come back and tell the people another lie. Because somebody lying. And in my opinion, it's the Minister of Finance line on this one. I go in with Rolando and William on this one. I think they're right. And I think the Minister of Finance is dead wrong. And he knows it too. But he has to deliver. He has to deliver. He was the poster boy. Everything going good in Samantha, all kind of nice write ups and everything about. Deliver, eh? Otherwise, see if these next write up going to be that you're in shambles, the budget in the good, and the country is this and the country is that. So, again, let me put it in clear English for everybody in Samantha to understand. If the Minister of Finance signs this loan, they could just as well stop governing. Because there will be no more support in Parliament for this government. Mark my words. Let's go over to another controversial issue. The National Health Insurance, some call it the General Health Insurance, and its miscommunications. I was quite disturbed with the many stories I kept hearing from people on the street about, you know, not understanding or knowing what the whole National Health Insurance was going to be all about and what it would cost them. I spoke of this last week. I even made a little short video about it. And within a week, much more has now come to the forefront. The worst part in this whole thing is that those that are responsible for this communication to be given to the residents of the country aren't doing such. So last week, Thursday, there was a huge meeting called by many union leaders at the John Lamini Center. A lot came to light of what's really happening or not happening at all. Over 150 questions were posed and I hope that these questions are going to be passed on to the minister and his team that is handling the NHI, um, the NHIE law. So that National Health Insurance law, a 200 and something page law. So that the answers can be given and forwarded to all concerned. Remember, communication is going to be key moving ahead. But the National Health Insurance is a new law, and it will actually replace the present laws that have been covering 
the general public, so the SFV sickness and accident insurance, and the OZK, which is the civil servants medical coverage. This law is going to close in those laws and basically have a new law with new regulations. Um, I don't know everything yet, but I'm going to give you as much as I know by now. <laughs> I've started doing a lot of research now and the information available that I have so far, I'm going to place these at the doorstep because this is what the NHI, GHI is going to look like. Can we afford what, what's in the law and what was written without the input of the users, the stakeholders and all other relevant parties? So allow us me, but the input of the unions, the doctors, the um, employers, none of these people, the drug stores, none of these people were really heard. And, you know, I spoke to some of these organizations and they said we were not heard. And the way the law looks right now, we are not going to accept that law. That is scary. Because here you have a 200 and something page law, but you spoke to nobody. And when the unions asked that question, they were basically told in no uncertain terms, this is a general law. This is not a law for the unions alone. So we will ask you some advice, but you will not be part of putting it together. Now the Social Economical Council is one of the most important because they give information on laws that will affect the country. Health, financial, whatever it be, any law can affect the economy of this country. Any law. So the SER should be heard. But the SER ain't functioning. Because up until this day, the people that have to be appointed on SER are not appointed. So I am not sure anymore because I know sometime back they went to the conference, the ILO conference, and the Prime Minister got a babochi from that group, the ILO, telling her to stop interfering with who sits on which seats. And she came along, oh, she was so surprised that they were there. They, 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 listen. Bottom line is, what happened, happened for a reason. Today, the SER can't give an advice because the SER is not functioning. And that's unfortunate. That's very, very unfortunate. Or let me rephrase, the SER is not completed. The, all the members have not been appointed. The national decrees have not been signed up by the Prime Minister or by the Governor or whomever has to sign them. Now, but it doesn't stop there. Because last week I saw the minister come onto Facebook and started answering questions on Facebook about videos that he is getting. Minister, we don't run government on Facebook. You should not subject yourself that way. I have a lot of respect for you. But you're making some cardinal mistakes right now. Sure, the pressure is on. It's election time and you want to be re-elected. I, I understand that and I respect that. And I think you're a good candidate, to be honest with you. But minister, when people ask him questions, when people send in you videos and so, you call a press conference and you lay down that information professionally and you publish it in the newspapers, you make a radio release or whatever. Going back on the Facebook to answer, it seems that this is just a joke. You say something, then they say something, then you say something, then they say something. This is not how you govern. This is not how you bring out important information. Let's get the facts straight. Great. But do it the right way. Do it the right way. Again, when you hear the Prime Minister coming out, Oh, all oh, this negativity being spewed on Facebook and in the social media. And today is for me, tomorrow is for you. That's utter BS, that's childish. 
If you all are not giving the people the information, what do you expect, Madam Prime Minister? What do you expect? Basically, right now, this government has been lying to the people of St. Martin about India. They have been lying to the people of St. Martin about the national health insurance. That's fact. Let's get the facts straight. That's what it is. So please, stop this stupidity about pretending. You know what's happening, and this is why we got to be careful with this government. Another critical question is, what will the premiums be for the medical coverage? Again, again here, if we believe what the CFT has been saying, that our health insurance is not sustainable. For it to become sustainable, two things got to happen. Costs got to go down, premiums got to go up. Other than that thing, a walk. Please, let us not lie to people. For us to become sustainable, we have to charge more money. And we got to make sure that the services don't go up, but go down. We already, SLV did a great jump where for about 90%, there are more, no more sending people off island. The medical center has been able to do a great amount of procedures here. So what you want? That's a great savings because I think they're still spending about 5 million going abroad, but at least 35 to 40 million has remained on island. Generic medications came in. All kinds of things are happening. But to bring down costs, to try to make it reach, you're going to have to raise the premiums. Otherwise, the book's in on balance. And within eight years, most probably, I think that was the term CFT used, the sickness insurance will be bankrupt. Remember the OZK already owes SFV 100 plus million. For all over the years, they never paid. Um, the civil servants share but again you also have the aspect of the copay because this is one of the words that keep coming up eh? this copay what does it mean exactly now at present the the civil servants they pay 4.75 percent of their salary they pay that to insure national the, the, the insurance as the insurance let's owe that car let's call it that the copay on this one is what are they going to pay additionally is about 0.95 percent so the employees are going to go up to approximately right now 5.7 percent that's going to be their new premium to be insured in the national health insurance the question that civil servants need to ask is do i maintain what i have right now and the answer is going to be no. Don't let nobody tell you it's going to be the same because that's not true and that's not possible. And I'll tell you why. In the new national health insurance, the government is also going to be an employer. There will be no more OZK. So those benefits are going to be integrated into the regular national health insurance policy and premiums. So if the premium becomes 15% because it has to increase. Right now it's 12 and a half for the SFV and the accident insurance, depending on which um, sector you work in, it can be between a half a percent to I believe 2%, something like that. It is going to increase to most probably 15%, the sickness insurance premium. Right now, if the government is being is going to be paying five, sorry the employee civil servant paying 5.7 percent that means the government will then pay about 9.3 percent that's what that's going to be and in the private sector i think it was six six and a half so six and a half was by the employer six was by the employee if it goes up to 15 will they divide it equally that the employee pays 1.25 percent more and the employer pays 1.25 percent more bringing the employee up to seven, the employer up to 7.75% and the employee um, up to 7.25%. Is this going to happen? Again, civil servants paying 5.7. That's lower right now than what the general population is paying in Samaritan through SZV. 
but that is going to go up. It's about the service we're talking about now. The service that the SZV recipients get now is most probably going to be the service the civil servants are going to get now. And if there's an additional service to be given, then the government will have to pay that additional premium to SZV. There's no other way around it. There is no other way around that. You're going to pay for what you're getting. Because right now, what we are getting is not what we are paying for. That's why the funds are going bankrupt. Now, there was this other statement that irked me a little bit. And the minister said about benefits. One of the benefits that he said that we are getting, and I, 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 I support him, is dentistry and vision care. Because that's something that the civil servants have in, the, in their agreement with government, but the SZV recipients don't have. So the SZV recipients now are also going to be able to get glasses and dentistry. Those are extremely expensive commodities. They are very expensive. Make no mistake. So every two years, we used to get, I think it was 300 or 400 or 500 guilders for glasses. That means the other 22,000 workers in SFV are also going to get that. That's what it means. And it's a great thing because then maybe the Lions Club don't really have to do all these vision cares anymore because the government is finally now covering it. But it is going to cost a good chunk of money make no mistake because vision and dentistry are expensive if we like it or not but again you know when you hear them say oh but if your wife ain't working she don't have to pay premium and if your children ain't working uh, sorry your children going to school so they are free it is exactly that problem that we took over from the Netherlands Antilles that is bankrupting these funds right now. It might sound harsh, and you say, God, Ban Camper, you have no heart? No, I'm telling you the truth. You need to understand what this really means. When we took over SZV as country St. Martin, it came along that. If the husband was working in the farm and the mother was home, she was a homemaker and they had three children, they were insured under your insurance too. They were insured under your insurance too. But could the insurance company hold that? No, it couldn't. It's going bankrupt. The ZV is going bankrupt. That's what they're doing. They're going bankrupt. And then we start throwing in accusations of, oh, ZV, bad spend the money. That is utter BS, man. They have a board. They are being audited all the time. So please, let us not go down there. Let us deal with the cardinal factors. One of them is, if you're not paying to be insured, somebody else is going to have to pay for that. That means the premiums have to go up. Not down. Up. That's where we're going. We are going up with premiums. So please, you all need to understand what it means. The service, again, I know civil servants used to have second class and I think the SGs had first class or the ministers got first class or the parliament got first class. Eventually, we can go to what they call the general population class. That's third class at the hospital. All right? Let's say, tell the people what it is, man. They ain't no lie. It's in the insurance. But you see, this insurance was supposed to start the 1st of January 2024. By the 11th of January 2024, the party would have lost the election if this was in fact in place. No ifs and buts about that. They know that and we know that. But to get this law ready, it's going to take time now. We haven't even spoken to the general population yet about this law. We haven't even heard the stakeholders of this law. We haven't. So, in place in 2024, whichever government sitting there, they're going to have to work this law out. Is the law fair? 
I don't know. I haven't been able to re read the law. I haven't gotten the document. I had hoped since it was such a, a, a general law that eventually they would have put it on, on, on the, uh, I don't know, on the uh, government uh, pages so that people could read it and give their opinion. But unfortunately, that, that's, not, that's not happening yet. So I, I don't know where we're going with it. But again, we, we have to understand that telling the general public a law is coming, but not telling them what is coming and then come out and tell them, oh, you're getting benefits, that um, vision care and dentistry, and if your wife ain't working, she ain't got to pay for it. That, that, that is nonsense, man. Come out and tell the people what the consequences are. Because at the end of the day, they got to pay for it. So what's the premium increase going to be, Minister? For the general population. That's all. Tell them. And if you don't know, then stop telling them what they're getting because you don't know how you're going to pay for it then yet. That's what that means. So if you're getting the facts them straight, let's get them straight. Again, I, I don't know if this is true, but two people brought it to my attention. They said, yeah, the new health care is called the Otley Care. I know the minister well, and I don't believe that that was said. Because if that was said, that's unfortunate. Very unfortunate. Let's hope that we can get something for the people of this country. Let's hope that the insurance can be paid and be made sustainable. Because if we can't do that, we will have a bigger problem on our hands. Let's hope that wellness takes a more proactive role than the reactive role that we have been doing. Kudos to the SFV and their crew that has been working tirelessly on this whole thing here. So I hope, I hope, I hope that the minister comes out and gives a better elucidation of what all is happening in this thing here. Remember, the pension age is going to be moving up again. And when the pension age moves up, it's going to put more burden on the fund. All the people need more care. Dementia and all these things are kicking in. Uh, uh, has consideration been held with this in the fund? Or are we going to create a separate aspect in the fund for seniors? Because like it or not, seniors have made the fund. Seniors should be able to enjoy from the fund. We don't just write them off and put them in a home someplace once they become a certain age. They are our mothers and fathers. We got to learn to respect them. What about the Sister Basilia Center? What about the district nursing? How does that tie in with the national health insurance? All of these are things that, that a lot of people are asking, but nobody is answering. And it's scary at the end of the day that we don't even know if the St. Martin home will remain the St. Martin home for everybody to go in because it gets a little subsidy from government or if it becomes part of the national health insurance and additional beds are going to be brought in, looking at studies, looking at the longer uh, working days and hours and years that are going to be added on to the work weeks of this country. All of these things must be part and parcel of this law. And I doubt it, I sincerely doubt it, if that was done. Low-income people, are there going to be exemptions for low-income people? Or people with, um, with other diseases that, you know, they, they, they can't work, they can't function in society? What, what's going to happen there? Is this part of the health? You see, the law isn't available, so the questions keep coming. And I hope, I honestly hope, that we can do something a little better than we are doing right now when it comes to the communication of what the national health insurance truly means for country Samantha. Over the weekend, we had the, I will call it the seniors day, I ain't call it the old person's day, the international day. And my mind ran on many a seniors in Samantha when I thought of while I was writing this national health insurance. How do we tell them what they will be facing? Because half of us don't have the information even of what's really coming. Some of us are privy to a law, but the population 
and most of the people in Samaritan are not privy. Many people that have to be part of this law to execute it have never even been spoken to or asked a question. So I hope for the best, but I fear right now for the worst. The police officer's payment, the draft criminal procedure code and the cancel justice committee meeting. You know, a lot of people didn't pay attention to what happened there. But I gotta be very honest with you all. I was extremely concerned when I saw what went down there. Um, the Minister of Justice, the Honorable Anna Richardson, asked for this meeting. This meeting did not have one MP from her party, the National Alliance, in attendance. They didn't even give a notification they weren't coming, I understood. It is questionable what happened there. Questionable politically. I don't think they didn't want to come, you know. I think they were instructed not to come. And the question is, why? Why were they instructed not to come to this meeting? This was a very important meeting, twofold. One, we were going to talk about the monies needed to finalize the legislative track of the function books and the payouts and all these type of things to the police officers. That was one. The minister came well prepared with her staff and everybody to explain where we're moving from here. The second point was going to be the draft criminal procedure code. And I'll get back to that one just now. I just want to stick a minute to this first one because this first one here, this um, payout and the function books and the justification has to do with a price tag of 44 million guilders. And that's a lot of money. Uh, uh, let, let us not fool ourselves. 44 million guilders, that's 10% of the existing budget yearly. So you're going to break that down over X amount of years. Initially, it was going to be five years. Um, I, I read a press release of the Minister of Justice. She said in July, they came to an agreement for 10 years. So they'd pay out any place around four to six million every year to the police officers. Um, there's more to that 10 years. And I don't think that 10 years had to do alone with the budget, but it also had to do with the position of the governor. All indications are the governor said he will not support a national decree of five years. It must be 10 years. Minister, if I'm wrong, please correct me on Wednesday. If you do not correct me, then I know it's factual. The second thing is, a letter was given to the police officers last week sometime that sent some of them in a frenzy. The, I haven't heard a word from the police union president. And that has me a little worried. I know the good gentleman has postulated himself on a political party. But as a union president, you got your duties to do. You know I speak to you very often. I, I call you. I tried to call you over the weekend to get uh, a little something from you, but I couldn't get through. And No issues. I'm not going to bash you, but I am disappointed, though, that you didn't make a press statement right after the cancellation of the meeting. You should have just come on Facebook and explained your members what going on. Or call a meeting and explain them what going on. Because this was a political message sent to the minister by her party. They don't want to get caught up three months before elections in this babal about how much money they're going to pay the police and how much money they're going to pay the police. Because it's a national secret right now what's in the amended budget 2023 for the police. The Minister of Justice hasn't said a word. The Minister of Finance hasn't said a word. So I don't know. Hopefully they know. Hopefully it will come out and it will be positive for the police officers. I truly hope so. Because police officers have been waiting 13 years for their money. Now the young officers that just reach here, eh? three years, five years, if they're gonna get pay, their retroactive pay over the next 10 years, they are young guys. But what about the fellas that are 50, 55, 60? They can't wait 10 years, man, come on. They have already been deprived 13 years of their spending power. 
And now you want to say, I'm going to give you that back over the next 10 years. So when I get my last payment, I was deprived 23 years of getting what was due to me from the first day. Minister, it's not your fault. I'm not going to put this burden on you. That'd be unfair and hypocritical of me. But minister, five years is more than enough. Five years is more than enough. The country going to have to make sacrifices and pay these people their money. They worked for it. This isn't something that they have to earn yet. They worked for it already. And that we are fighting about if we don't have this in the national decree, I'm not signing. This is utter nonsense. Then let them send it up to Holland for annulment. But send it for five years. Let those that say it ain't gonna happen, send it to Holland for annulment. Let Holland say that our police force don't deserve to be paid their money. Since they could send money for all kinds of other things. Send money and pay the police officers. I mean, this going too far. I'm not being unreasonable here. I don't see why I would have to wait 10 years for my money too. Not because of my wrongdoing, but because of the various previous government's wrongdoing and this government's wrongdoing. Because you're all involved too. You have been sitting there for four years. Four out of 13, that's a lot of years. And previous to that was your party too. So let us not go throwing blame on previous ministers alone. Because if you're doing that, you could blame your own party too. So again, this is not about throwing blame. This is about doing what's right for the people of this country. Police officers have family too. They too should be able to get their money. 10 years is way, way, way too much. But again, when you don't see not one MP show up to have this meeting. This was not a meeting where motions could have come and all that stupidity. This is a meeting where the minister would have been given the opportunity to explain the police officers the, what's really happening, the justice workers, what's really happening, where are we standing. The public of St. Martin would have then understood the stress that the police officers are working under. Because it's a stress. Cost of living, everything going up. The only people ain't really getting their money are those. And that's unfortunate. That's very, very unfortunate. People are supposed to be in a higher scale, in a higher position. They still are not getting that. Telling me I'm an inspector and you pay me for Brigadier is a joke. Because I'm carrying a bunch of responsibility that I'm not being paid for. So please, the love of country and job stops, you know. And the love for oneself then takes over. And we call it then, oh, you're being selfish. No, I'm being real. This is the problem we have here. And we seem not to be able to see this and, and deal with it. And, and again, we got to do better than this. I'm disappointed in all four of the NA members that did not show up because there was one coalition member present, one MP Bryson. Nobody else was there from the eight in coalition. Eight, the guy, you know, one was there. But we are one, we walk in. Well, clearly, Minister of Justice, you are not one of them. Because they let you out to dry. Because they wanted to send a message. And that message is clear to the police. We don't care about you. That's how simple it is. Don't let nobody fool you. Let's go to the second agenda point. Because that's a more interesting point. The draft criminal procedure code was discussed in Parliament. Before I was suspended, I was involved in that committee. A lot of work was done by the law firm, and they created a whole new draft criminal procedure proposal. That proposal was, I think they had, if I understood correctly, about 14 to 15 meetings of the Justice Committee. They vetted everything, all questions were asked and answered, and it was sent, I believe, in June, July, to the Minister of Justice for her to review it, send it to the Council of Advice, 
get the advice needed. And I think there was in the letter also a request to send it to the courts and to the prosecutor's office so they could give advice on it. They could give their opinion on it. Let me call it that way. They could give their opinion on it. Not that that is binding or anything like that, because Parliament prepared this law. They're the initiative takers in this law. And once that is done, it comes back to Parliament with the advice of the Council of Advice and whomever else had to give an opinion, the, maybe the courts and, and, and the prosecutor's office, they would approve it, send it back to the government, government approves it, and then it goes to the governor and the governor signs the law. Or that's the way it should be. Remember that for three years, Parliament has worked on this initiative. There was a draft law that came in from whew, 2018, I think it was, 18, 19, someplace around there. And this was tied to the CAF. Remember, oh God, if we don't follow the CAF, we can get gray listed and then um, nothing can happen in this country with our finances, blah, 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 blah. Had to do with money laundering and ter terrorism financing, those big words that they always use. This is what I was. Today, the law has been amended in such a way that the victims also have rights and that the suspects get a fair trial. All of these things are in this law. Once again, it is not the law that was presented four years ago. It's a rewritten law. A law where the parliament can find itself in. A law that the parliament of this country has to approve. And once the governor signs it off, it be, is um, checked by the Ombudsman, I think, for yeah, within three to six months. And eventually it becomes law and it is published in the National Gazette and the, how you call it, the courts then start to implement it. But there was a strange twist on September 8th. Why do I know the date so good? Because I was in courts 4th, 5th, and 6th. And on the 8th, we had weather come in. And on the 8th, there was this new judge um, appointed here in St. Martin. And the president of the courts was here. The chief prosecutor was here. And they made a statement that I talked about two weeks ago, I think it was. That if the parliament of St. Martin doesn't approve the draft criminal procedure code, that they can have a problem because a lot of court cases the prosecutor might lose them because they will be deemed inadmissible. And to be deemed inadmissible means you did something wrong. You didn't apply the laws right, the time that you had, whatever. But it means that you didn't do something in compliance with the law. That's the only reason you become inadmissible. So when the president of the courts said that, it caught my attention. And when I listened to what's happening now with this law, it caught my attention because this law was sent to the minister already and the minister was to send it on to the courts. So most probably when she came here last week to the meeting, she was going to most probably give their opinion or their findings, whatever. That too was wiped off the table because there was no meeting. And it's, it's interesting to see what's going to happen with the draft criminal procedure code. Because there are two school children are saying that the one that was made in parliament now, E. Floyd, you're going to have to go for annulment most probably because the big boys don't want to sign it. Then so be it. Because every country codifies their laws. We are no different. We don't run by the Dutch Criminal Procedure Code. We run by the St. Martin Criminal Procedure Code. And we can codify our laws if we so desire. I hope those listening understand that nobody can bully St. Martin into anything. We have been bullied enough when it comes to justice. We are the biggest criminals seemingly in the kingdom. But I know for a fact that one ain't true. You know, if at present 
investigations are being done in a way they shouldn't be done, then don't do them. Who said it means that the end justifies the means used can work in a normal society, but not into a justice democracy. Because if you behave like a criminal to catch a criminal, then you are a criminal. Let's move on. You know, every week I like to expose a few things that go wrong during the elections. And the amended budget 2023 is one of those. Because somebody gonna smoke their pipe. Some crapper gonna smoke his pipe. Because they gonna have to put the money to pay the justice workers. Otherwise, they don't see the budget passing. I don't see that budget passing. If they ain't gonna pay the money, the coalition members and most probably the opposition is not going to do it. But again, the game of hide and seek they play in with the Minister of Justice makes many wonder what's really happening. So again, let's just see what's going on. Let's see what's going to happen. Van Hoffelen's visit here last week, or Saturday gone there, was strictly to ensure that Aaron was ready to sign the Enya loan. And she's going to Kyoso to talk to Pisa on Tuesday, I believe, to make sure Sylvania signs it as a mutual agreement. They ain't worried. The parliament's too much right now. And they're going to see what they could help them with to get things done. Listen, anything other than that is just jokey. You come here to talk about slavery. What do you come to talk about? The museum? What were the reparations? If you ain't coming to talk money, you're gone just now. Elections in Holland is November something. Nobody say you're coming back. Why are we even entertaining these discussions as government? Tell them we'll wait for the new government and we'll discuss it next year, March, when that new government is formed. Why are we entertaining a discussion that ain't going no place? Right now, they don't have no money to give us them. What, what are we wasting our time for? For all these Nancy Godu stories. Because that's what it is. No more, no less. But again, we're going to get jammed for 30 more years paying back loans because our Dutch puppet going to sign off that agreement. Wait, we're going to see. Again, I hear the Minister of Tiat last week in a press statement, but oh, how he is um, enhancing the transportation section by giving out taxis and bus licenses. I think G's and T's going to follow just now. Is going to be helping the entrepreneurs. No. Again. What you're doing, you know, just as good as me, is totally political oriented. The bus market is messed up because they got too many buses, most probably already. Help chauffeurs are now going to become chauffeurs. You can give them a plate. So the people that they used to run for are going to now ask for a help chauffeur. Or they're going to put a chauffeur to run their plate. I, I, I don't see nothing changing there. All you did is you put more buses on the road. Because you're not taking away the plate from the person that has a help chauffeur. Because you can't just do that. You'll end up in courts and you'll lose your fight. You know that. We all know who has to, um, by who they have to go to sign up to get a plate. The bus has to have on the stickers of the party that you say you have nothing to do with, etc., etc. Minister, if you really wanted to help entrepreneurs, we have a lot of them. We have musicians. We have people that do arts and crafts. We have vendors that sell food. We have vendors that sell um, stuff at the marketplace he was going to build. You see, Minister, in an election time, you got to be very careful what you say because whatever you say will be used. Not against you because you're not a factor. You're just a puppet there who have to do what he has to do. Then you will get your year payout and you go your melee old way again. And you go run your tours. But this country is going to suffer because of your nonsense. Your accountability will come yet. 
it will come. I can guarantee you that one. Because I'm sick and tired of these games that we are playing with this country. There is no space in the transportation world to do what you're doing. Have you spoken to them? Have you spoken to the taxis? Have you spoken to the Arab? If you wanted to really make a change in transportation, Minister, you know what you should have done? You should have picked up that long lost document called Changing Lanes. You should have built a bus terminal. If you really wanted to do something for your entrepreneurs, instead of fattening up all your pockets with these bus permits I given out. All right? I told you already. I'm going to expose all you. This is utter, utter nonsense you're doing. Other people are afraid to tell you something, but I am not. I can call you out and you can do whatever you feel you got to do. I brought back and I feel damn sure you going back down. I could tell you that one. I looked at the newspaper Thursday and I started laughing. One of the articles says, we're going to deal with the teachers' vacation days. The other one says, we're going to tackle vaping in the schools. The other one says, we're tackling, we're going to put a tracking system on school buses. And we all know exactly what going to happen. Absolutely nothing. All the things that have to have happened for the past four years have not happened. And election season has started and the pipeline is throwing out things faster than they could even make them up. Minister, go fix the library now, man. Jesus Christ. Seven years. Seven years. Nothing. No library. They're still up there by Adolphus. Not even a breaking of ground. Nothing. Schools. Nothing happened there. Museums. Nothing happened there. Heritage Park. Ripped from under your nose. But you're tackling other things. Minister, please, man. I tell you already. You're a good man. You're a good fellow. I really like you. You got great bread. But you're a horrible minister. Why don't make room for somebody else to do that? In closing, again, I want to congratulate MP Bryson and MP William Allen for finally putting down their foot regarding the nonsensical approach of this government for the ENIA loan and what's probably behind it. The Minister of Finance clearly will have a very difficult time to get the amended budget 2023 passed if he doesn't say no to the present ENIA loan or make some serious commitments and give in to a lot of things that the parliamentarians will want. I strongly ask you all, take the proposal that was made by me and presented by MP Emmanuel and run with that to solve the ENIA problem. It's a win-win. I don't have to be inside of parliament to ensure that the people of Samaritan are taken care of the right way. For two years, while I have not been in Parliament because of a faulty constitution of our country's constitution, this government has sought every possible excuse not to legalize weed, nor the tolerance policy, so that our people, especially the younger generation that is deeply involved, will stay out of jail keep a clean police record, be able to still go to school, but most importantly, would have become legitimate businessmen and most probably millionaires. We prefer to keep them as beggars and criminals instead of making, letting them make legal money and pay taxes. It would have been a great new economic pillar if we would have only started. I hope we don't miss the boat, but thank God elections are due very soon and hopefully with a new government and a new set of thinking people we will be able to make the change that we need to make in this country for the people of this country. I'm happy that other politicians have recently also, also started following me and taking up the plight for the seniors and the pensioners. I hope it's genuine and not just because of elections that are around the corner everybody is doing such. 
when I'm in office, I know that with some of them, when I bring the proposals, in the benefit of our seniors and pensioners, I can count on their support for these legislations. I hope, like I said, that it's not just some political stunts. I care for our seniors. I believe in our seniors. I know someday I too will be a senior. And I hope to have the necessary legislation in place that seniors can at least still continue uh, enjoying their golden years. They worked hard for them. Now, I need to leave you with some food for thought. Our national health insurance needs to be properly explained to the people of this country and they need to understand the cost involved for them and their families. Not because we have an election in a few months should we start dancing around the facts and stating things that we already know. Tell us what we don't know yet. Parliament finally standing tall instead of playing the coho game of good cop, bad cop will expose the inability of the finance minister to bring this matter home. Clearly, the minister seems to be the fan favorite of the Dutch as he goes along with everything without any fight. Wish he was a little more like the Curacao finance minister who clearly thinks for himself. The whole silence about paying the police officers is just shameful and the playing of politics with it is a total disgrace. The persons work for their money and they should demand they are paid. And whoever doesn't want to sign the decree should just send it up to annulment. Let the Dutch say our police shouldn't be paid. Why you ain't taking a loan to pay police officers what they are owned for 13 years already? But hey, let's just go build some roads. Our seniors and the less fortunate residents of this country are crying out for the much needed help and the government is just closing their eyes and doing things that are hurting them more and more. GB is going to get much more expensive over the next few months and there's absolutely not one peep from the shareholders about any sort of relief for the people of the country. Who are you all trying to fool with your, I mean, I have to use that word, government, that you're working for the people, that we are one. The helicopter view, wait and see strategy, we are one, and I can go on and on, is just a load of stupidity right now. The country continues to be placed in a financial dilemma that will hold another generation hostage, and the government is joyful and calls the Indian loan a great thing. All people deserve to know what their future will be. Not lie to about how hard they're working and only negativity is being spewed at the government. People are expressing their real feelings and the government needs to wake up and smell the coffee. The time to wait and see has passed. <coughs> Failing to plan <coughs> is planning to fail. And this government has done this over and over and over. Please share my podcast and also like my YouTube page and subscribe to it. You all have a wonderful week. Please keep your eye on Philippe. But ah, Philippe, or your dilly dallying and untrusted at all. Bunks is out. Have a great, great week ahead.